Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, it's my great pleasure to w welcome you here today and to uh, to kick off this this day's discussion. Um, we are gathered to spend some hours exploring 21st century oils. Um, we're looking at a genuine revolution. Um, it's been spurred by years of high oil prices that created technological change uh, in a way that has taken an economic sector that is so large that we're used to th thinking of it as being able only to change slowly uh, the way a super tanker does inch by inch and transformed it into a sector that's looking more like an America's Cup racer, boom, boom, in, in, in changing in ways that were a few years ago unthinkable. Uh, the projection that you've all heard that the U.S. in 2020, for example, could be the world's largest oil producer as well as its largest consumer. Um, and uh, were it not, I think, for all the other things on the United States plate uh, right now in um, its economy and its frozen politics, we would be, the country would be spending an awful lot more time thinking about this extraordinary change and how it can be managed in a way that will balance the enormous economic value that it promises uh, with the equally enormous threat that it could pose towards the world's climate and towards the ability of countries uh, to take steps to control emissions. Uh, we've been looking at this issue at Carnegie, the Unconventional Oil Initiative that has been led by Deborah Gordon, who has, uh, together with David Burwell, put together today's event. One of the things that comes immediately evident is how very large the information gaps are um, about this enormous array of new oils, um, which differ from each other in, in everything from the technologies and the amounts of energy needed for extraction and processing to the slate of marketable products uh, that these different oils yield. Um, so these, tech, these information gaps are a first step uh, in, in moving towards um, uh, sensible policy. Uh, we've organized today's discussion uh, in three sectors, technology, economics, and policy. Um, and we hope to try to um, fill those information gaps that can be filled and to identify those that urgently need attention. Um, at the same time, um, then we will be looking at the policy choices. Uh, my own feeling, um, since I have the the podium I get to, to, to say it, is that this revolution um, is finally poses the challenge uh, that the country should have met decades ago, um, uh, that the only way it can be sensibly managed is through carbon pricing, um, that attempts to regulate this enormous array of resources um, uh, will, will simply invite um, a policy uh, disaster. Um, the oil revolution also um, poses a, uh, puts a new urgency on steps to improve efficiency. Um, almost certainly we're going to be using more fossil fuels. The only way we can, we can do that compatible with uh, a climate sustainability is going to be to be using uh, using them more efficiently. And um, in that respect, I think uh, the Obama administration, the first administration's um, raising of CAFE standards um, was a, a step of enormous importance that also has gotten far too little attention in the campaign and, and since, um, but it's certainly not enough. It was a big step, uh, but we have uh, uh, major challenges ahead, and that um, we will hope to look at today as well. Um, 
in short, we're looking at uh, almost overnight a whole new array of policy choices in a field that has been pretty much stuck in a in a very um, uh, familiar uh, policy framework, and this is now about to get turned on its head, uh, which makes today's discussion, I think, all the more interesting, e exciting, and important. Um, we're going to, uh, I mentioned the, the framework for the, the meeting. We, we have three distinguished journalists who will help guide the discussion. Steve Muffson from the Washington Post, Bill Loveless from Platt, and Monica Trousey from EETV. Um, at lunch, we're going to hear from Steve Cole, whose book, um, Exxon Mobil, Private Empire, Exxon Mobil and American Power, looked deep into the innards of, uh, of the oil industry, looked at its culture and its thinking and decision making, and I think will add an, an, a very important um, set of insights for this discussion. So let me um, end by thanking uh, those, the foundations and funders that made today possible, the Energy Foundation, the Oak Fund, and the International Council for Clean Transportation. Uh, we're very grateful to them. Um, we're also grateful to our panelists. Uh, we have a terrific array of experts uh, planned for today, and to all of you for, for joining us um, for this conversation, this exploration. Uh, so let me um, turn now to David Burwell, who's going to introduce the first panel. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome. And um, uh, uh, I just do want to say how uh, pleased we are to have uh, so many people here today and also such a great array of experts to talk about this important subject. Uh, I, We'll introduce uh, Debbie and the first panel very quickly. I'd just like to make one point, uh, a historical point. You know, when last fall, when Jessica decided that Carnegie was going to uh, write a book about uh, 10 challenges and opportunities uh, facing the president in the new, uh, new year of 2013, uh, it was going to be five opportunities and five challenges, and we were assigned uh, uh, unconventional oil and gas as, as one of the topics. And we kind of thought about it and said, well, now, are we on the opportunity side or are we on the challenge side? And, and the more we thought about it, the more we realized it is an opportunity. You've got to ac accept the fact that uh, this is a blessing in terms of uh, plenty uh, in terms of energy. It, it's going to provide jobs. It's going to uh, help our balance of trade. Uh, it provides economic opportunity, global competitiveness. There's no way to, that, to say that this is not uh, a blessing uh, uh, for us. But on, it is not unqualified. Uh, it has to uh, be managed. And uh, uh, exhibit number one for that is uh, you don't have to go any further than the front page of the Washington Post today. Uh, where Juliet Alperin uh, announced, uh, you know, translates the, the finding that we are now, in 2012, continental United States was a full degree hotter than the historical high for the annual uh, average temperature. Uh, it is 3.2 degrees higher than the average temperature for all of the 20th century. Uh, so climate is a challenge, carbon is the problem. How do we balance this opportunity uh, against this very challenge of, of staying b below uh, uh, the, the threshold of, of global warming? So that's what this is all about. Uh, as Jessica said, we have the diagnostics in the morning, we have the policy in the afternoon, bracketed by Stephen Cole, uh, who wrote the book uh, Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power, who's going to talk about the role of the energy sector. Uh, in balancing these two challenges. Uh, so the format is kind of, we're going to Hollywood. Uh, we're doing kind of like a TED talk to start with. That's why we have this backlit screen here and Debbie can uh, do her thing. She's uh, <laughs> kind of an exhibitionist. Uh, and then we're gonna have our panelists come up here, uh, give a little talk, respond to, to Debbie's uh, comments or each panelist's comments, and then we're gonna have a general discussion. Uh, we're very pleased, uh, I, First, want to talk a little bit and brag on 
Uh, Debbie Gordon, probably one of the best decisions I made coming to Carnegie was asking her to join us. Uh, Debbie's a chemical engineer by training, spent 20 years, uh, actually worked for Chevron, permitting offshore drilling rigs, I think, uh, and then uh, worked for 20 years for the Union of Concerned Scientists, started their transportation program, uh, and has been a consultant and, and an educator, and is now with us running our unconventional oil project. Uh, after Debbie's talk, we're going to go to Adam Brandt. Adam is an assistant professor at the Department of Energy Resources and Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, he studies uh, and his research is on the environmental impacts of energy, and he's particularly focused his recent work in the assessment of historical greenhouse gas emissions trends in the oil sands industry. So he knows all about uh, the chemistry and, and the content. Uh, in addition, we're going to have Michael Schall. Michael is the Director of Ga Natural Gas and Biofuels Analysis at the Energy Information Administration. Uh, Michael knows all the statistics about and forecasting for energy use in the United States, including oil. Before that, he worked for Bechtel and uh, was a consultant for a while with Energy Ventures Analysis. Steve Mumpson, as we said, is, is the um, uh, energy director, energy writer, journalist for the Washington Post, and he's going to be our moderator and rapporteur for the first panel. So why don't we start with Debbie. Can you hear me? So um, welcome. I mean, we got a lot of welcomes to the people. And thank you for everyone for both participating and attending. But I'm going to welcome you to a brave new world of oil. Because that's really who's in the room. Is this something that is going to be very different? And I've heard from many people, some of whom are in this room, that the last 20, 30 years of knowledge that many of us have acquired in this subject is a primer for what we need to know, but it's not still complete. We now, there is so much new about oil happening that we almost have to re-educate ourselves. And then the, the qualifier I often give is that, and this happens a lot on the Hill and with policymakers, the common denominator in oil is chemistry. And it's usually not everyone's favorite subject. So it's a little bit challenging to re-educate on oil. Um, this is about a paradigm shift. So those of you in the audience who really thrive on skating in terms of change and get excited about working about on things when there's a change ahead, this is it. We're in, we're in moments of change. We saw it today in the paper with climate change. But in terms of supply, energy supply, gas sector, oil sector, what's going on in coal, we're talking about real big changes. So I was going to ask for a free association with oil. When I say oil, you know, what would you think in terms of free association? Transportation, right? You know, that's what people think about. And it is true. Oil, about 70% of oil goes to transportation. But what's interesting when you look at the question from what is oil, oil is so many things. It will still be transportation. That will always be a very dominant force. And we have to focus on that. But we can no longer just focus on transportation to solve oil issues. Oil is about 6,000 different products in our economy. Baby diapers, perfume paint, plastic bottles. So it's everywhere. And oil, as it changes, becomes more things. And that's what I was going to talk to you about today. If in the end of this talk, you have more questions than you have answers, I will have succeeded. Because that's really what this paradigm shift is all about, figuring out what the right questions are. So this is oil. This is gas. This is coal, actually. This is hydrocarbons. This is the world of what fossil fuels are. But this is what oil is becoming. Oil is becoming, and it used to be, I get my pointer, oil used to be this and that, getting heavier over time. The last 25 years, if you worked in this sector or thought about it, you were really operating in this sphere. And the whole industry is around, designing around that sphere. And our products are set because that's the raw input. So we're, we're making products out of what we've already always been given. Now what's starting to happen is some oils are getting really light, natural gas liquids and condensates. Those actually don't even really make gasoline. 
We'll talk about that a little bit. They make other you know, petrochemicals, totally different thing. And now we saw with the BP spill, we're going really, really deep to get oil, but in unconventional ways or less conventional ways, where a big, big breakthrough is tight shale oils, oil that's not, you know, it's trapped. That oil, actually we thought that oil would come out of the ground similar to conventional oil. Turns out a lot of that oil is coming out of the ground with more of this stuff in it, with a lot more natural gas and condensates. Then you get to extra heavy oils. California's been going heavy. Oil's been getting heavier and heavier. I'll tell you in a second what, I, what that means. But as it gets heavier, we are now venturing into, this is the really interesting part here. Bitumens are ancient oil. This is the oil sands up in Canada. There's also in Utah um, and, in, and in, the, in the Western states and, other, and Venezuela, other places in the world. Bitumens have been in the ground so long that bacteria started to eat them apart. And they've taken the liquid out of the oil, and what remains is on its way to coal. You can make oil out of it, but it's kind of a transition between oil and coal. Kerrigan is really interesting. This is the oil shale, not to be confused with what they call shale oil, but the oil <laughs> shale, the Kerrigan, which is in the Rocky Mountains, the big source that in the 70s we were starting to discover and think about using, this is immature oil. This hasn't been in the ground long enough to become oil. But we're so technologically adept at managing hydrocarbons and transforming them now, and we'll only get better at it, which is why as oils change, everything changes, because we perfect things, at least technologically we try to. So the oil shale Kerrigan is immature, so we have to accelerate time with technology to turn that into oil. And the question about all of these is what's the price and what's the access? Any and all of these can turn on at any point. There's no rationality right now to what turns on. We're in this transition, and it could all turn on at once like natural gas. It could actually hurt the market if it all turns on too quickly. And some of these things deserve to stay in the ground longer because they're very carbon intensive, and others should be managed better. So this goes into a little bit more detail in terms of what I was just saying. So you have all of your oils as they have been here cluster in the center. And what's interesting about this graph is to show you how different oil is becoming from itself. So not only is oil becoming all these different things, even what we called conventional oil, which is right here in the purple, move here, um, sorry, um, is now actually differentiating. And then what's really interesting about this field, and why I want you to have questions, because we don't know enough about them yet, the information gaps Jessica mentioned, is what's happening at the edges. So we have what we've started with the extra heavy oils, the tar sands, the oil sands, and then we have these ultralight oils, which are coming from the Balkan in North Dakota and Eagle Ford in Texas. Those are very different, not only from oil, as we've known it, but from each other. So this is a story not only about oil, but also about the carbon embedded in it, because it's really that carbon that creates our climate challenge that we have. The rule of thumb is the heavier the oil, the higher its carbon content. And the reason that's the rule of thumb is that it's hydrocarbons, as we said. Hydrogen's very light. Carbon's very heavy. So the more carbon in the oil, the heavier the oil. So if you have a barrel of bitumen and a barrel next to it, of Eagle Ford ultralight oil, they weigh, they're both the same volume. They weigh very different amounts. So this is interesting because it puts it in terms that you think of familiar substances. Bitumen is the consistency of window putty. And um, I tried to think of something you wouldn't even know, but the ultralight oils might be more the consistency of nail polish remover. Very volatile, it stinks, you don't want to keep it open very long. So these, if you think about window putty, or peanut butter next to nail polish remover, you can automatically see we're trying to make the same old products out of very, very different inputs. So this is trying to take a um, <laughs> building blocks, maybe we should call them building rings, just to give you a sense of the extra heavy versus the ultralight oils. Because again, it's at this periphery of oil where everything is changing the most. And the extra heavy oils, what this tries to show, without giving you too many numbers, is the darkest red it are the building blocks of that oil that actually are the heaviest parts of that oil, the residual. It's the stuff that, that bottom of the barrel. 
So the extra heavy oils have a tremendous amount of bottom of the barrel. And then as it gets lighter red, the components, the building blocks get lighter, more toward gasoline. The center of the circle, the center circle is ultralight oil. And as you can see, there's very little residual bottom of the barrel in that ultralight oil. But that has a lot of white, which is more gas, more like natural gas. So these oils, last three slides have really made one point. These oils are really, really different. They're different from what oil's been, and they're really different from each other. So this is what we're up against. What are we going to do to turn these very different oils into something that we want? Because the bottom line is, no one wants raw oil. None of us can use raw oil. We talk about oil like it's a thing, but the reality is it's a feedstock. It's not anything we can use. It needs to be tremendously processed. And that's part of the paradigm shift, because all these processes have to change to accommodate the new oils. So this is like the Rube Goldberg of you know, a basic, you know, the basics of a refinery. But as you can see, in one schematic, depending on, again, the types of oils that come in from the lighter oils in yellow to the heavier oils in red, you get a whole host of different products out. And what you get out has everything to do with what you put in. We're pretty heroic at transforming. We can even turn coal into gasoline if we want to. But when you do that, you have to put a lot more energy in and you get a lot more carbon out. So it transforms the carbon equation tremendously. So this is the oil supply chain. This is the, you know, the center stage of the paradigm shift. This is where everything is going to change from the um, how we explore and produce these things, basically how we extract them, to how we transport and refine them. Refining is going to be a huge shift. We could talk about that later. And then also what products they make. There are a lot of shifts. So I just wanted to give you quick visuals of what oil is and, ha and is the transitional and the conventional stuff versus what it might look like with um, growing unconventional oils. So you have standard production. You have fracked oil. That's the second picture. You have platforms offshore, some ultra deep, and then you have Arctic drilling in some situations. All of those are pretty much liquid oil as we know it. They come out in different ways, but they're liquid oil of varying types. Then you have to, you have to move them around. Either they go by pipeline, or they go by barge, or they go by tanker, or they go by rail tank. Interestingly, a lot more rail, rail right now moving oil around tremendously. And then they get refined into all the things that we, we need. You know, these products. Largely, the lighter the oils, they go into the petrochemical feedstock, the gasoline, and the jet fuel, and the diesel. And that's our economy, largely those. This is the world of changing oil. This is the world at more of an extreme. This is when you dig for oil, because again, it's ancient and very solid. And this is when you have to gasify it, the second picture, underground. And this is where you are taking your um, kerrigan out of the ground, very similarly, digging it out. This is the immature oil they dig. Or this is where you're actually putting heat under the ground to get your kerrigan in the Rocky Mountains and elsewhere. What changes when you deal with this is you still have transportation, both getting it to the processing and then products. But you need to add a step to upgrade it. It has too much carbon in it. That's what we've been talking about. So you need to have a much more complex refinery. And all the refineries in the US now have been upgraded to be these types of refineries. So we don't have refineries in the US largely that can deal with the light oil anymore. Because about five years ago, we thought all we were going to have was the extra heavy oil. So now these are the refineries, the, the upgraders. And then it still has to go to yet another step of being refined in an extra heavy refinery. So upgrading strips the carbon out. And then it has to still be refined. And then here's the kicker. You get different products out of it. You, don't, you get some gasoline. You don't get petrochemical, much of any. You get some gasoline and diesel, a bit of diesel, and jet fuel. But then you get a lot more bunker fuel, the real heavy stuff. And then you get a lot of very interesting, because no one even knows about it, pet coke. Petroleum coke is the coal hidden in oil. It's that solid part that the bacteria left. And it has to be stripped off. And it goes into industry. It replaces coal. And what's interesting about the story is Canada has been stripping this off up in Canada, stockpiling it, and shipping it to Asia. But the plan is to send it all down here. The plan is to bring all that bit raw bitumen here and strip it off in the US. And now we are going to have a lot of pet coke on our hands, which is, again, a transfer. it's a paradigm shift. It's not something that we're being used to for oil. So the next step that we've been thinking about working on is indexing these oils. And indexing them in terms of both, I think this part left off, but in terms of their actual embedded carbon, what products they make in terms of combustion, because that changes, as we just said. 
and then also those process inputs, and Adam will talk a lot about that as well, because there are differences in these inputs when you put different oils in, and the two together, what you get out, the products and burning them, and what energy you put in to make it into those products in the first place, those two components are what end up being the real snapshot of how oils compare in terms of their carbon emissions. And you can't have one standard for all oils because all oils are very different. So if you want to manage carbon, you have to really start to disaggregate and ask about indexing oils. So these are some of the information gaps. I'll just leave you with some thoughts here because these are the big questions. No two rocks are the same. No two source rocks are the same. Therefore, even when you're talking about shale oil, no two shales are the same. No two bitumens are the same. So there's a lot of differentiation even within these types of oils, and there's a lot of information that we still need to know. The critical aspects of unconventional oil are not well understood, especially regarding climate, but also regarding water. There's a need for transparency and social responsibility here, bar none. We must know more about these things because these are huge investments. And once the infrastructure is built, it's very difficult, very costly to change it. And it's very disruptive. And then the third one I thought to put here was one I just caught recently because it feeds into the whole idea of policy that we're aiming toward the end of the day, is that if we don't include the carbon emissions and, and these, the energy consequences of these oils into the equation, the market can't work well. We don't get, we, we want to discuss having a free market. There's a lot of change in this sector and the industry wants it to be free. But if there's no guidelines, then basically, Anything can happen. And as um, the University of Cambridge was arguing, we'll get questionable outcomes for trade and for investment. So I wanted to close with this, and it actually relates to, very sadly to, the walls, to, to all the stories today. This is a 1962 ad. And I came upon this because Steve Cole writes about it in his book. Thank you. When he comes, I thank him. 1962, Humble Oil. Humble Oil in 1962 said, there is enough energy in the Arctic to melt all of the glaciers. And that is something to celebrate. That's energy. That is like, that's, that's cause, so, you know, we are going. But the irony of all of this is now we circle back into all the CO2 that we've gotten from developing all the oil and all, the, all of the fossil fuels. And it's really that trapped CO2 that's melting all of the glaciers. So with that, I will um, again talk. I think today is going to be a really good day to talk about the 21st century challenges that we have ahead of us. There is this oil optimism that David mentioned, but this climate challenge. And the question is going to be, in a very you know, optimistic time, how do you guide development? when everyone is so excited about something new. I would argue it's the best time for rules, because if you don't have structure, it's very difficult for even industry to operate. But there, it's going to be very difficult. It's hard to have to, to tamp things down when times are bad. And we already know it's, time to, it's very difficult to modify things when times are good. I say we're in very good energy times. And the question is, how do we manage that? So with that, we are going to change around the stage and bring our first panel up. And we'll start our discussion, which actually includes you a lot. We've left about, hopefully, half of each session for the back and forth um, through the rapporteur so that you'll get a chance to ask and tell and talk, which is the benefit of being in, a, in an event like this. this thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Um, my name is Adam Brandt. As uh, said, I, I teach at Stanford. Um, my plan is to talk for perhaps 10 or 15 minutes. I've got some talking points to prevent myself from rambling. My students know that I can ramble at times. I'll try not to, although if there's something particularly interesting or juicy, I may not be able to uh, resist a, a digression or two. Um, I'll lay out what I view as uh, sort of seven key points relating to unconventional oil in the environment, and then I'll lay out uh, three steps forward from my perspective as a scientist working in this area. Uh, first key point, uh, these unconventional resources are extraordinarily large. Um, our waypoint here, our way to measure this, will be the amount of, of oil consumed since the start of the Industrial Revolution or the start of the oil industry in 1859. Uh, uh, from 1859 to the end of 2010, the amount of oil consumed was about 1.2 trillion barrels. So we'll call that one 
trillion barrel. Okay, so we have, we've consumed uh, since the start of the oil industry about one trillion barrel. Um, uh, these numbers are very uncertain, but in terms of resources in place, the oil sands have one and a half to two trillion barrels. Um, uh, uh, the oil sands of Canada, uh, extra heavy oils in Venezuela amount to another trillion barrels or so. Uh, heavy oil globally are one and a half to two and a half trillion barrels. Uh, oil shales, not shale oils, but oil shales uh, represent perhaps uh, six or more trillion barrels. Uh, there's a lot of oil there. Um, as a whole, across these three resources, uh, throughout these 10 minutes or so, I'm going to call these unconventional resources, unconventional oil or low quality resources. Um, so, so to start with, uh, you know, just to emphasize, these magnitudes are enormous. Uh, economic reserves that are currently published are much lower than this. So for example, uh, economic reserves of the oil sands are something around 0.3 trillion barrels. Um, History suggests that we should not pay too much attention to current economic reserves. Those change and grow as technology changes. So those are very much a lower bound. Um, and we're going to move much closer to the resource in place, I would imagine. Uh, two, this is not just a Canadian issue, and it's not just a current issue. It's not just sort of in the present. It's a long-term trend. Uh, Low-quality oil occurs globally. There's significant production in Venezuela, Indonesia. The, uh, the industry was invented in California. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman are expanding um, production of heavy oil with steam injection. Uh, so this is, this is uh, happening globally. This, this trend towards uh, low quality resources uh, is a long term trend. So as I said, the industry was actually invented in California in the 1960s. There's been 50 years of steam injection uh, in California. Uh, there's a long timeline of technology development and expertise uh, that's been developed. It's not sort of a, um, necessarily an instantaneous thing. Three, there's a wide variety of production methods, and so it's challenging to actually um, uh, parse or, or, or uh, say with certainty uh, what the impacts of unconventional oil is, because there's a variety of ways of, get, of getting the resource out. There are surface mining methods, which, which Debbie showed. There are also in situ production methods, which involve uh, largely injecting steam or other heat carriers into the subsurface. These have very different impacts. Surface mining, you're going to have um, is used to access near surface deposits. You're going to have more uh, land use uh, impact, more water pollution typically, more water use. Uh, but they tend to be a little less energy intensive and a little less carbon intensive. In situ production processes, you have quite a bit less land impact, less water use, but they tend to be more energy intensive. Okay. Uh, those are the sort of the, the current suite of technologies, but there's lots of things under development. I, I look at this stuff all the time. There are companies looking at um, uh, inserting uh, electric resistive heating, like a, a heater element for your toaster, into the subsurface and heating the, uh, the bitumen um, uh, with uh, basically electric heat, right? And so there's a variety of um, uh, ideas that are, that are being explored and, and, and uh, lots of work going on in this area. So this wide variety of production methods makes it a little difficult to characterize uh, with sort of a broad brush exactly what's going on here. Uh, for uh, the way I view it is the economic pressure to produce these resources is, a, is truly enormous. There's large and growing demand in Asia that's more than compensating for the reduced demand in, in uh, the US and the EU. And I think this is going to continue to be the case. There's a lot of pent-up demand there. Uh, this is, should be coupled with, and, and you should always uh, sort of keep in mind that this is coupled with a lack of investment opportunity for international or investor-owned oil companies. Um, the large part of the, of the um, uh, reserve space for conventional oil has been effectively nationalized, either, either explicitly or, or sort of uh, de facto. And so the, the vast majority of the resources locked up in, uh, uh, the conventional resources locked up in areas or uh, deposits that aren't accessible to, to investor-owned oil companies, except in fairly um, unfavorable uh, production sharing contracts or sort of technical service contracts that aren't as profitable as the traditional oil development. So this is why the, the, the publicly traded oil companies are hunting after the, the, you know, the extreme deep, uh, the Arctic, the oil sands, because this is where they can access reserves, and they need to replace reserves uh, for shareholder value. There's almost unfathom, unfathom, fathomable sorry, uh, amounts of money at stake here. This is really uh, important to realize. The current oil sands reserves uh, at current prices are worth about $30 trillion. Okay, that's the value in the ground. The resource in place is in the hundreds of trillions of dollars. Uh, this is a lot of money. Uh, there's sort of this uh, uh, 
inexorable or sort of unstoppable momentum uh, of the market chasing after this next resource. This is not just sort of a flash in the pan. There's a lot of people interested in keeping this carbon in the ground for environmental resource, uh, for environmental reasons, saying we need, to, we need to not produce this resource, we need to keep this uh, carbon in the ground. The challenge there is, is actually thinking of a metaphor for what that effort is going gonna, is gonna to involve, trying to keep this carbon in the ground, if that's the goal. Uh, the, the one I came up with perhaps was, uh, you know, you're standing at the dike trying to hold back the water and you have this massive uh, sort of um, um, uh, force on the other side of the dam and you're trying to plug holes and you plug a, a hole that's the Keystone XL pipeline and it springs out somewhere else, either in Canada or elsewhere. These oils are globally available. Uh, they're sort of the next resource and this is where the industry is going. You can contrast this perhaps with the wind industry, which has had incredibly dynamic growth of more than 50% per year, but then the tax credit is threatened to expire and investment collapses. Okay, so that's a very rapid trend, but it doesn't have this sort of underlying gut inertia or force that's, that's um, sort of driving the oil companies after this low resource. Uh, this is not a fragile trend. This is not a trend easily derailed. This is, a, this is an oil tanker steaming ahead, to use Debbie's metaphor. Uh, five, uh, low quality oil, uh, hydrocarbons have fundamental production challenges that, that affect the carbon intensity. And Debbie talked about this. The character of the resource, that is the fundamental physics and chemistry, is quite different uh, with these resources. Uh, sorry there. Um, I can project also. I don't know how long that's, that's been bad there. Um, uh, there there's fundamental. Uh, uh, chemistry and physics at work here. Uh, Debbie mentioned the high viscosity of these low quality, low quality crudes. I think of them as somewhere between peanut butter on, on the good end and road tar that's used to patch uh, uh, roads at the high end. These aren't going to flow without heat, but if you apply heat, they can, they can flow. The, the carbon to hydrogen ratio in these crudes, as Debbie mentioned, is, is off compared to what we want for our liquid fuels. You've got too much carbon and not enough hydrogen. Two ways to deal with this. You can coke, you can reject carbon, in which case you're going to end up with pet coke and other byproducts. What happens to these byproducts? Or you can add hydrogen through hydrotreating or hydrocracking, uh, make more light product. Where does the hydrogen come from? We don't get it for free. There's carbon associated with that, producing hydrogen from natural gas. You can draw a comparison between these, these fundamental drivers of carbon intensity for these unconventional oils and that associated with, for example, natural gas flowing. That's the source of high carbon intensity crude oil uh, is associated gas flowing. Associated gas flowing is largely an economic issue. It's more economic to flare the gas than to try and get it to market, so you do it because you can't make any money off the gas, so you, you, you just sort of dispose of it as a waste product. That's a very different problem. That's an economic problem as opposed, that can be fixed with regulation and this sort of stuff. Uh, as opposed to fundamental physics and chemistry where you can't regulate away the extra carbon in these fuels. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, largely this is not a story about sort of bad actors um, or people who can be um, uh, convinced with simple policy changes to, to change their behavior. This is a story of uh, this is the resource that we have and we're going after and that's, that's the, what its characteristics. Uh, six, the potential greenhouse gas impacts are large. These low quality hydrocarbons have uh, greenhouse gas increments or uh, uh, adders compared to conventional uh, uh, crudes of something like ten, generally 10 to 30 percent on a full fuel cycle basis compared to conventional oil. Some will be higher, uh, some may be a little bit lower. Um, on a per energy basis, this, uh, uh, this magnitude is roughly equal in size but op or equal in size but opposite in sign to the benefits we might see from uh, sort of conventional biofuels if you ignore land use change um, <laughs> I have to say that or uh, switching to CNG vehicles so so those benefits are on order this um, this size but obviously uh, in the opposite direction the scale of use of these resources almost certainly means that this adder, uh, this sort of emissions increment, means that the global fuel uh, pool has gotten more carbon intensive over the last 30 years uh, um, uh, rather than less. And I do a fair amount of historical analysis, and this is one of the things I'm going to look at in the future, is what the global uh, fuel pool is doing, but I'm almost certain it's gotten more carbon intensive, not less. Uh, seven, transparency and data availability is a huge concern. In general, data availability in the oil industry for the public is poor. Uh, proprietary analysis is the norm. Um, there's a lot of work by, uh, by um, consultants or industry experts that's typically not as transparent as we like. Even a lot of the academic work uh, is not as transparent because it'll be based on proprietary data sets. Uh, at Stanford, uh, we've been working on, I've been working on 
a variety of efforts to build more transparent models funded by the California Air Resources Board. So for example, I have to put in a plug for my model here. We've developed a model called OPGI, the Oil Production Greenhouse Gas Emissions Estimator. And the goal here, and this was developed for the regulatory process in California, is to have a fully transparent model where you can argue about our assumptions, but you can see them. You can see exactly how we did the computations. Anyone can download the, the, the worksheet. Anyone can download the documentation and see what's going on here. I think this is, this is vital in this area where transparency is still lacking. Um, one last point, and then I'll, I'll get into what I think. Oh, sorry, that, that's my last point. We'll, we'll get into some, some, some steps forward. So given this, given this sort of set of challenges, how do we actually move forward? And this is from my perspective as sort of someone who's trying to understand what's going on here, not necessarily someone who's trying to make policy. I think we're going to talk about that later. Um, uh, first step forward, I think there's numerous sort of incremental additional analysis that's needed, um, you know, despite the work to date, and we know that there's this uh, incremental carbon intensity, there's quite a bit of uncertainty, particularly with non-North American resources where the data availability is extremely poor, Venezuela, Indonesia, other places, uh, Middle East. There's a lot of disparate data sets that need to be pulled together, and we're, and we're working on this. Um, and there's, I think there's room for a lot of statistical analysis to try and understand these trends. A second step forward is the need for, for robust and transparent uh, uh, scientific modeling tools. I think our work on, on the OPG model, the Oil Production uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Estimator, um, is a first step in this regard, but, but what I think needs to happen is uh, something much more robust, uh, something much more uh, stable and long term, something more user accessible, a web interface, an app, something like this, uh, where interested NGOs, interested parties um, can, can contract uh, with someone and say, hey, there's this new technology, let's call it Fracking Plus. It's a new sort of technology that's been developed. Let's relatively easily uh, build a module within this framework to analyze the impacts of it. So that every time we're not sort of, the analysis community is not caught flat-footed and trying to reinvent the wheel on trying to understand the impacts of these. And that's a long-term goal for me over the next five years or so. A third step forward, and this is sort of the intersection of the policy, um, is that I think, I think policies are needed to increase uh, transparency. Uh, current f uh, policy frameworks is, exist in terms of the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which I could talk about in fair detail, or the European Fuel Quality Directive. I think these uh, standards could and should be tailored more towards uh, uh, increasing data reporting. Um, uh, and, and specificity and, and uh, more data availability in the public domain. And, and my fundamental perspective here is that what isn't measured can't be managed, right? And so, uh, and what isn't measured and available in the public domain can't be managed uh, from, a, from a public goods perspective. I think there's fundamental changes needed, needed in, in reporting uh, requirements, and I think this will help us understand these trends because currently right now we're sort of flying in the dark. I think reporting alone, even without stringent uh, standards associated with it, is at least a step in the right direction because then we can start to, um, as, as analysts or a, as um, sort of uh, policy folks, we can start to understand better what's going on if we've got more data. And so, you know, even if, even if a carbon tax is, is far down the road and maybe isn't going to happen, uh, I, I think just reporting and more information is needed. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. I figured we could get into the details in any one of these issues in the discussion section. So feel free to, to ask any questions, but I thought I'd be brief there. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Well, my name is this on? I think I turned it off. Totally. Echo. My name is Michael Shaw. I'm, with the, I'm the director of the Office of Oil, um, Petroleum, Natural Gas, and Biofuels Analysis within the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And for the last few years, our focus has been on tracking the rather astonishing changes that have been occurring with regards to shale gas and tide oil. Um, changes have been brought about by the um, significant advances that have been made in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Now, I speak about these together because uh, it's important to understand with what's going on here that uh, these technologies, which involve accessing the source rock directly where the hydrocarbon is uh, present in a continuous framework as opposed to being accumulated uh, in reservoirs, uh, the ho horizontal drilling has allowed for accessing along these continuous resources, and then the hydraulic fracturing 
has allowed for creating fissures or fractures that have allowed for these hydrocarbons to, that had previously been trapped in, in their original source rock uh, through these fractures to the borehole and therefore to the well. Now it's important to um, consider both the natural gas and the oil because uh, the early successes with this technology was with the natural gas and, and from Deborah's presentation here earlier, she showed uh, the quality of the hydrocarbon, uh, the viscosity, uh, and with what's been going on with the shale gas and tide oil, it's um, low viscosity. It's really what it means is it's small chain hydrocarbons, uh, methane, CH4 being the smallest chain hydrocarbon there is, more easily transports um, through these fractures to the borehole, therefore getting produced. And so what's happening is that even though the industry had been producing from these original source rocks for many decades, the technology is allowed for producing um, what would have occurred, say, over a 30-year life of a well within just a few years of a well. And that has a tremendous impact on the ability of the industry to uh, capture revenues, uh, generate cash flow, and allow for reinvestment in uh, both the technology and, and further production. Um, now, what, is, what has happened um, with the advent of the technology is that uh, we've been able to produce more effectively the heavier hydrocarbons, which has led to the um, production of the tide oil. So we've had the increase of the, that occurred in uh, the Bakken in North Dakota and, and now the Eagle Ford in, uh, in Texas. Um, so really it's technology has created new resources out of rocks. And the technological advance that has occurred has led to um, taking what had just been a rock previously to something that has been uh, less expensive to produce uh, on a per unit basis than what had been conventional before. So from our standpoint, it makes it uh, a little difficult to differentiate between what is unconventional and conventional. Um, uh, and we're finding that there's some difficulty with even understanding what this uh, phenomenon uh, is doing or as it's transpiring because we're looking at data from what has occurred in the past. And the technology shift that's happening here is, is a sudden abrupt shift. It's not something that is uh, taking years to percolate through and therefore you have a lot of time to look at the data. It's uh, happening on an annual or even a month by month basis. And that has uh, resulted and it's reflected in EIA's own data and also in our own uh, projections. Now, while it's true that um, the technology for um, producing the tide oil or shale gas uh, uh, is not uh, applicable to every shale deposit, um, mineralogy within each of these shales um, uh, dictates to a large degree whether this particular technology can be usefully applied to it for unlocking the hydrocarbons. Um, however, it's been consistently proven to be able to produce the hydrocarbons within the U.S. and now into Canada that um, it is clear that this is largely going to be a global phenomenon. Um, before I move on, um, we have a team at EIA that tracks what's occurring uh, on this monthly basis and is responsible for doing updates. Uh, John Staub uh, leads the team. If John, could you just stand up? And sitting next to him is Sam Gorgon, who uh, runs, our, runs our modeling and does quite a bit of this analysis. Um, and so they're quite busy uh, keeping up with what's going on uh, here in the United States. So as I mentioned, um, shale gas came a little bit before um, tide oil in terms of its breakthrough in the technology. And to give some, some idea here, 
Um, shale gas currently produces about uh, 27 BCF a day. Uh, this is through November of 2012. And this now constitutes, the shale gas now constitutes roughly 40% uh, of U.S. dry gas production, which is uh, basically just from a few percentage points uh, as late as uh, 2006. So um, that has led to a, a number of factors, uh, one of which has been a, for lack of a better word, a glut of gas uh, that many here are, are aware of uh, with Soaring production, uh, the uh, industry has seen prices plummet, and plummet to levels that have um, led to um, dispatching gas fire generation in, in front of coal fire generation in many parts of the country. Indeed, um, we note that during 2012, there have been several months in which uh, gas fire generation in the United States matched coal fire generation in the United States. And that's something that I wasn't sure would happen even in my lifetime. Another um, phenomenon with what's been going on for both the shale gas and tide oil is uh, the investment that has been proceeding uh, in that sector. Uh, there has been, as I said, uh, uh, a global implication of the technology. And since 2009, uh, companies representing countries from throughout the world have invested roughly $27 billion into joint ventures with U.S. firms to develop shale gas and tide oil plays. Now, when they do this, what they're doing is they're funding drilling programs and one of the reasons for doing that is so that they can learn the technology and apply it in their, their areas of the, of the world. Uh, this has been one of the sources of financing that have kept drilling levels at, at high levels uh, within the United States. Turning to tide oil, this has been rather significant. Um, within the last two years, uh, the U.S. tide oil production has increased uh, 1.1 million barrels per day. Uh, these are very large levels. Um, and currently, tide oil uh, constitutes about 29% um, of uh, U.S. supply. Um, and what is, that has meant is that uh, U.S. crude oil production uh, during uh, 2012, we estimate, has um, grown by 760,000 barrels per day. So during 20, the year 2012, the U.S. production grew 760,000 barrels per day, which is the biggest yearly increase since 1951. Uh, this is truly a, a, an amazing accomplishment uh, by the industry. And as a result, um, if you can would imagine what that line looks like. Uh, you can imagine uh, what John Staub's team's trying to go through, trying to understand how that rapidly ascending line uh, can be uh, turned into forecasts and projections. And what that has meant is we've had to um, repeatedly, sometimes on a monthly basis, reassess um, what the drilling rigs efficiencies are doing uh, how fast or how productive these rigs are at drilling um, these wells, as well as um, what the um, initial production rates of what's coming out of these wells. So both of these uh, aspects of that's driving production are changing are, and are approving. Um, the industry is drilling more wells for each rig, and we're also getting more out of the ground faster um, with each of these wells. We forecast that the 6.4 million barrels per day that was achieved in 2012 will now increase to um, 7.9 million barrels per day by 2014, uh, which would be the highest um, level of crude oil production in the United States since 1988. Uh, by the end of January, um, uh, 
of, uh, by the end of December 2014, we would see uh, crude oil production have increased 33% since January 2011. So these are very, very large changes. Now, when we include biofuels, of which uh, the U.S. has undergone quite a bit of uh, increases in production, natural gas um, liquids, which also come with the production of both the gas and the tied oil, uh, the U.S. is projected to achieve about 13 million barrels per day of production uh, by the end of 2014. Now, one, one thing I would caution with that, and, and this is something that EIA has said, uh, when we look at the U.S. as uh, increasing this level of production, that doesn't necessarily mean that the U.S. Um, is equivalent to, say, uh, a Saudi Arabia. Um, while the numbers are quite high, and indeed on a levels basis, um, those are uh, roughly comparable, uh, the U.S. Um, does not operate in the global oil markets uh, to the same degree that, that OPEC does. Um, our industry is, is responsive to prices, responsive to regulations, um, and we do not um, change levels of production according to uh, a, a cartel type of agreement, and therefore um, <coughs> would, would not be uh, directly impacting prices as terms of setting um, production quota requirements. So it's important to understand that there are clear distinctions be, to be made between the U.S. and its um, production and consumption of fuels within uh, the world versus other countries as well. So what does this mean from a longer term basis? Well, already since 2005, 2006, um, the U.S. was looking at a net uh, liquids fuels import share of 60% and at best maintaining roughly 60% levels through 2025, 2030. Uh, with this increase in production, we've seen the import share decline rather rapidly uh, to 45% in 2011, and we see that declining to um, 37% by uh, 2045. One of the key issues to understand here with uh, the shale uh, gas and tide oil, and tide oil in particular, is uh, how will these wells perform? Now, uh, as I said, um, we've had these rather large gains in, in production. We're getting very good at drilling all these um, wells. However, um, these wells also have high decline rate <coughs> as compared to conventional production. Uh, and a key open question is uh, how sustainable is production from these wells in the longer term basis? Certainly, uh, the history that we currently have suggests uh, that there will be limits to just how much can be relied upon uh, for production of tide oil uh, in terms of uh, increasing growth before we end up getting into a pattern of drilling wells just to replace production that had been lost from wells previously drilled. From a from a climate perspective, um, while I wouldn't uh, um, discuss uh, the climate impacts in the same way uh, David Brandt has, um, there have been uh, quite a few changes to the U.S. Uh, energy mix, both in the production and consumption of fuels. Um, certainly, the uh, improved energy efficiency uh, has allowed for decreases in electricity uh, consumption growth. Uh, this has put a lid on our uh, need to build uh, much in the way of new capacity. This has had both positive and negative impacts for, for uh, uh, 
outlooks for certain types of fuels. Uh, renewables in particular uh, have uh, uh, some trouble in being able to gain market share where what they must do is displace uh, technology that has already been built uh, and it's much harder to do that when that other technology has sunk costs. Uh, on the other hand, um, we also see that uh, the increased uh, CAFE standards are projected to have significant impacts on U.S. transportation fuel demands. Uh, and in our latest annual energy outlook, the decrease in, in U.S. transportation fuel demand exceeds a million barrels per day by 2035 uh, as compared to our previous year's projection. Uh, and this does also have a dramatic impact on uh, total U.S. energy-related uh, CO2 emissions, such that in our uh, projection, we show that uh, U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide emissions will remain more than 5% below their 2005 level through 2040. And I'll just stop right there. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, I'm Steve Mufson. I'm the energy correspondent for the Washington Post, and I thought maybe just take a, a brief step back to, to try to make all this seem a little more tangible and uh, to see, to talk for a moment about how it's affected my job. Um, I actually started covering energy for the Post um, <coughs> the day that the uh, price of crude oil crossed $70 a barrel, and everyone was hysterical. We thought that was really bad news. <laughs> Today, I think we'd all think that would be very good news. Um, and you can't really um, separate um, this a topic of this panel, which is about different types of crude oil from, from even uh, sort of uh, popular newspaper stories. And um, one example of that is um, a story I did uh, recently about a refinery in Philadelphia, which is hoping to take advantage of the fact that we have uh, this sudden surge of relatively high quality light oils coming out of the Bakken, which uh, need a place to go and could actually make sense to, to carry by rail all the way to Philadelphia because the refineries in Texas are busy using um, lower quality oil for which they were upgraded uh, to be able to, to, uh, to handle. And of course, the Keystone Pipeline debate is also very much about uh, a story about the differing qualities of oil and the type of uh, lengths that you go to in order to get that oil to a place where it can be processed. And, and the, uh, the impetus, uh, or a lot of the impetus behind that whole project is really an effort to get these low quality uh, oils from from the uh, from Alberta to to refineries in Texas, which are able to handle it, and I think that's one reason why Trans Canada and Canada has been uh, committed to making this work, even if it if it requires a uh, long wait in the permitting process here, because the the opportunity for refinering is better in the Texas coast than it would be, say, uh, in the Chinese coast. Um, the, um, I actually uh, covered the oil and gas industry in the early 80s for the Wall Street Journal, by, uh, mostly by coincidence. And one word that we, we never used at that time was climate. And, and I think that um, you know, we were worried about price, we were worried about supply, national security, the rest of it was all kind of familiar. But, but climate is, uh, I think, the thing that really changes this whole conversation and, and tempers whatever enthusiasm we might otherwise have about, about new supplies. Um, and I think that it's a challenge for the environmental community, which I think has, in some sense, piggybacked off the idea of scarcity and the possibility of rising prices to make its case for more efficient use and different kinds of regulation. And now that really needs to be adapted in some way to to, I wouldn't say abundance, but, but less scarcity than there was before. In fact, I think my, uh, one of my, uh, my, I think one of the challenges of writing about all this is this idea that whether or not we're really shifting from an era of scarcity to abundance, because I think abundance is a relative 
a relative word, and we have, in some sense, what I'd like to call irrational exuberance about, about the oil situation, because <laughs> prices are still very high, and the climate challenge is, is very large. And those two elements, I think, should, should really uh, temper some of that exuberance. A lot of people talk about how much progress we've made in reducing oil imports since 2005. And that's truly impressive. But in fact, our oil import bill is, is slightly larger than it was in 2005. So from a balance of payments point of view, and contrary to what some people would like you to believe, Canada is still a foreign country. Um, <laughs> from a balance of payments point of view, uh, this is still important to the country, uh, how we manage that. So um, I think just to come back to this issue of different qualities of oil, I, wanna, I wanted to maybe start us off um, by talking about a couple of the challenges. I think that this change in quality, and Deborah's written that there, there are 160 different qualities of oil out there in the crude oil out there in the market right now. So how, how do we handle this from uh, both a resource point of view and a regulatory point of view? And I thought maybe we could focus on that, because it seems to me that's a lot of what the issue is. How do we uh, regulate so that we're uh, doing something about the carbon emissions of these heavier quality fuels? And uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the California low carbon fuel standard, because that seems like one way. But you know, we're not just talking about CAFE standards anymore. It's something more complicated than that. So um, maybe we could talk a little bit about how that's worked in California, what some of the shortcomings there might have been, how that might be applicable nationally, or, or maybe there's a better idea when we're talking about applying this nationally and um, in a way that would make, uh, that would uh, take advantage of some of this abundance while at the same time doing something about, about the carbon issue. So, Actually, Deborah, or well, any one of you can start. I'll start out because yeah, please, uh, because my answer would be very, very short. As uh, part of the Energy Information Administration, uh, we do not advocate or promote any policy. <coughs> so, therefore, by law, I'm excluded from have a, having an opinion on the subject. Uh, I will note <coughs> that uh, one of the challenges that I'm sure David and Deborah will, will address is one of the main challenges associated with uh, oil in particular is that it's a globally traded commodity. It's very easy to put it into a ship, a truck, a train, and send it um, around the world. Uh, the logistics could be overcome, and, and, that, and that perhaps is one of the key challenges. So I was just going to add that we do have the third panel that's going to delve a lot into policy mechanisms. And I know there are speakers for the low carbon fuel standards and actually for carbon taxes. So you know, it might be worthwhile delving a little bit more into how policy has to mount itself to deal with this full range of oils that are out there. Um, there was just a story I was reading this morning that you know between the the ultralight oils that are coming from Eagle Ford and Bakken, there's also the odd connection to what they're calling these dumbbell crudes that now are coming. The ult, the extra heavy oils are actually being lightened by the ultralight oils in order to move them. It's like taking hardened paint and putting paint thinner into it to make it you know reuse it again. So they're lightening these extra heavy oils using, say, the Bakken condensates are being mixed in with the bitumen in Canada. And as Steve said, the Gulf Coast, and my, my note I wrote to myself immediately was, why Texas? I mean, it could go anywhere, right? But why Texas is profound. Why Texas is because Texas is the Gulf Coast. And there are so many new oils with so many new products and innovation all around to make the most profitability-wise of these oils that these dumbbell crudes are really interesting. So you take this ultralight condensate that could become petrochemical feedstock and oil, but instead you're running it north to Canada to blend into the pipeline that they're building to bring the extra heavy now it can move because you've you know, lightened it with the ultra with nail polish remover mixed into you know putty, 
And that then moves down to Texas. You strip the ultralight off, you get to sell it again. Because now it's a petrochemical feedstock, but it also got paid for by being a mover, you know, it was part of the dumbbell crude. But now in Texas, you have extra heavy oil. With the refineries, Steve was saying, you have extra heavy oil with all this money that's been invested recently in extra heavy refining. And we get a whole new slate of products coming out of Texas that actually have market potential to both be used in the US. So as Michael was talking about our own carbon footprint, that has to do with a lot of our processing. But a lot of this carbon, we're going to process, and then we're going to export it. So we're going to become, just as Canada will export the carbon and the extra heavy to us, we'll process it and export a lot of it. Some of the extra heavy we'll use. I heard that there's a refinery now, not a refinery, a power plant being built in Texas, in Beaumont, I think, that's um, looking to combust the pet coke. So it's basically a coal, coal power plant. But it's not going to be burning coal. It's going to be burning pet coke, which is actually 10% more CO2 than coal. So you get this acceleration that happens. And so it goes back to the questions we'll talk about in panel three policy. But if we could somehow parse out with the knowledge we have on how do you even think about policy when you have so many regimes? And again, this is just the US. Now we have the global framework in, a glo in global commodities. So we have all of this carbon moving around for the benefit of market and profitability, and we're trying to control climate change at the same time. That's really the, the big question, I think, here. I, yeah, and, and I can, and, add, a, and, I can add a little bit. And also, it. maybe you want to talk a little bit about another thing I just want to ask about is the whole res the water resource issue, um, because that seems to me another constraint that we that has grown with the with the uh, forays into lower quality crudes. But maybe you want to go to the yeah, first one. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk for a few minutes about the policy approaches um, in California and in the EU and contrast them a little bit. So the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard is an effort to differentiate um, uh, fuel feedstocks based on their carbon intensity. Um, uh, when, the, when the regulation was first established, uh, crude oil was assigned a single default value uh, and biofuels and electric vehicles and natural gas vehicles were compared against this and assigned credits or debits accordingly. Uh, since then, uh, California has realized that there is this wide variety of crude oils that everybody's been talking about elsewhere. And so they've moved to uh, um, assessing every single crude oil that comes into California using our tool. Uh, the regulation um, was just updated in November. The board uh, passed the updates that instantiates the, the use of our tool to assess every crude oil that comes into California, assign it a carbon intensity, and then construct a weighted average. This is a very detailed approach. Uh, this is trying to get uh, at, at sort of the specific characteristics of different crews on a field-by-field -field basis. What's the flaring at this field or this crude from Nigeria? Um, what's the steam injection rate uh, for this field in California? The EU Fuel Quality Directive is a similar regulatory process in, in the EU. It's taking a much broader brush approach. It's taking sort of a basket approach. So conventional crude has a certain value. They've broken out oil sand and oil shale. Those have given values. Um, and there's, but beyond this broad basket approach, there is not a, a effort within the fuel quality directive to get specific about a given crude. Now, you think in policy design, one of the trade-offs, and I'm sure they'll talk about this on the later panel, is specificity versus ease of use. And I think that this is the one hand versus the other. In California, uh, they've got people on board now who are working with me and people at Stanford and people at ICCT and elsewhere. Um, to understand and model each of these crude oils, collecting data about fields in Nigeria. What's the flaring rate? What's the water injection rate? Um, what's the, uh, what sort of gas processing equipment is going on? The benefit there is that with specificity, you've got a fine-grained tool to affect things. If somebody's got a carbon-intensive process, they're going to get deemed, right? Because their steam injection rate is high, and this may incentivize producers to change operations, become more efficient, etc. Uh, with the EU Fuel Quality Directive, they go for a more simplicity-based approach. Everything is assigned to basically a basket. Reporting is easier. There's less data requirement. But it's a more broad brush tool. You don't get this sort of fine discernment that allows you to say, this crude oil is more carbon intensive than that one. We want to incentivize it. I want to um, come, come back to, to what you said, Michael, about um, 
about the, uh, the, the nature of crude as a global commodity. And this is a challenge with regulations both in the EU and California. Let's say a crude oil is assigned, a, a crude from Canada or from uh, the heavy oil fields of Indonesia is assigned to high carbon intensity. What happens to that in this regulatory environment where you have essentially islands of regulation that discern the high carbon intensity of that crude, assign it a penalty, right? And then uh, in a sea of, of a global context where this discernment is not made and there's no uh, penalty associated with this high carbon intensity. And this is related to, uh, uh, proposed to be the cause of something that's called crude shuffling, which is, as you might imagine, um, California is willing to pay a, a premium as per the regulation for low carbon intensity crudes. Other uh, regions don't, uh, don't discern this difference. And so it may cause uh, shifts in crude patterns, uh, crude trade patterns. And so this is certainly one of the challenges. Um, California has tried to address this with the modification to the regulation. Um, uh, you know, but, but I think this is, this is actually just one uh, very detailed facet of a much more general problem of regulating climate in some regions and not others. It's, it's a general facet of sort of leakage problem. And I, I don't have an answer to it in particular. Uh, it's just one of the challenges. Um, my, my general response is that some region needs to move first. And so if the EU moves first, and start to assign a, a penalty to these high carbon crudes, then well, okay, uh, that may uh, not uh, change the global mix yet, but somebody essentially has to move first on the regulatory front. And as this regulatory approach um, <coughs> sort of catches on, then there'll be you know, maybe a, a more even increment uh, across the global market for this carbon penalty. One other thing I was wondering is how you see this uh, affecting prices, right? Do prices, um, I mean, there, is, uh, there are some people who argue that, that, that prices will start coming down uh, in, a, in about four years or so. Um, but it also seems to me not just the question of the price of the benchmark, but because there are so many different types of oils, we have a whole slate of prices as well as benchmarks. So what do you see happening to the price as these uh, newer types of oils come online? And, and how might that affect um, the whole debate about this and the economics of it. I'll, I'll start. So um, <coughs> prices have already been affected um, in, in many ways, some of which you can see within the prices of the United States. Um, the West Texas Intermediate uh, has been trading at a significant discount to um, other crude oils similar, uh, such as the Brent crude oil. Um, Production up in um, Montana, where the Bakken's at, have experienced even uh, larger uh, price dislocations. And this has been brought about by the um, shifts in where production has occurred around the country. Um, and the uh, transportation infrastructure hasn't kept up as of yet. So those investments are, are being made have been made, and some of the uh, dislocations have gone away, but uh, still persist. Uh, now, uh, to the extent that those uh, price disparities from one region to the next um, remain, then that becomes a, a large magnet for investment. Uh, and uh, it becomes a who who can take advantage of the price disparity um, and how how that might proceed uh, that becomes an issue now uh, another aspect of what's been happening is as been mentioned uh, the bulk of these crudes are are light sweet um, and they have been already displacing quite a bit of the imported light sweet uh, so those, those changes are already underway. Uh, within uh, the United States, we also do have, uh, particularly within the Midwestern United States, uh, some many simple refineries. Those refineries have experienced a boom because uh, they can very easily take these light sweet crudes and turn them into products, and they're selling these products largely on a competitive basis with other refineries that don't have the access to these uh, lower cost uh, crudes. Uh, and they've also been um, uh, advantaged to make investments to, <coughs> say, put in 
unit train receiving terminals and these, these types of investments in order to um, make more use of these crudes. Uh, so um, when you get down to the Gulf Coast, um, you're talking about now what might happen with regards to international pricing among different qualities of crudes and will there be enough light sweet displacement on a, on a global basis that the differentials between what is heavy and what is light will change. If it does, then perhaps the Gulf Coast refineries will continue to run these heavier crudes because they'll be able to buy them at advantage prices. Um, if it doesn't, perhaps these uh, refineries will choose not to run their cokers and instead run light sweet. Uh, it kind of depends on the prices for both the crudes and, and the feedstocks uh, that determine whether that would happen or not. I, with respect to prices, I, I generally don't like to speculate. As I'm sure you guys deal with the EIA, it's very challenging to project, uh, project price because it's such a sensitive indicator that it can shift very rapidly. My, own, my only comment there is that uh, we're in the midst of a... Of a um, I guess still moderately deep and, and slow burn global recession and the oil price is quite high in historical terms. Um, I work with the majority of our students in our department at Stanford are from Asia. Uh, they're all looking for a better life. They work very hard. Uh, I have great faith in humanity's ingenuity and desire for energy. Um, I don't think demand is going anywhere. I think high prices, at least with respect to this discussion, what matters is, is the price going to be high enough in the future to incentivize production to basically carry uh, uh, investment forward in these unconventional resources at a profitable rate, which is depends on how you say maybe it's fifty dollars, maybe it's seventy five. I think prices because of growing demand in Asia. Um, I think prices, uh, you know, I, I got to imagine they're going to stay there. This is the double edged sword with climate. Um, you know, I, I want I want these these students and their families in Asia to to have a better life. Right? And they want to have a better life, too, and they want to use energy, right? So, and, and far be it for me to tell them not to. So it, that's, the, that's the big challenge with climate is, is how, do you, you know, how do you balance this, this desire for more energy, uh, which I think is there and I think is strong. So I, I think this, this trend has legs, and I think the price is probably going to, it's hard to say, but um, you know, I, I can very easily see the, the price staying above these levels uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Debbie, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think my two cents on price would be, like Adam, not projecting price. I think that our chances of having volatility in the market are pretty good. You know, EIA has, um, in its projections, looking forward almost immediately anywhere between $60 a barrel and $200 a barrel. So that tells you that there's a lot of potential for change in this market. But I think more on a policy, with my background more of a policy, to me, price is the most powerful information in the market. That's how business decides what to invest in, that's how people decide how, you know, what to purchase. So I do see a need for a moderating force on prices and if with all of this, they're calling these oils, which we called unconventional, opportunity oils. That's the new word, you know, everything is an opportunity here and there anything can happen. So the question is how do you build a price for carbon into those decisions? Because that's what's going to help moderate and some of that, you know, can help the fluctuation, if you have counter-cyclical action that we've written about um, at Carnegie, that you can actually help the Chinese and others when there are these fluctuations in the market, because this is going to be a really rocky takeoff for a brand new industry. It's transformational. So, Well, I thought maybe we'd open up for, for questions from the audience, get a better sense of what you're on your mind. Go right ahead. There's a microphone coming There's. down. <coughs> Uh, thanks. Um, I'm Jack Riggs from the Aspen Institute. I want to build on a few nuggets I've heard this morning and then ask a very specific question. At the very beginning, Jessica mentioned that we probably need a carbon price to avoid uh, a horrendous regulatory scheme to try and deal with this problem. Um, I think Adam said something about some of these, uh, the, the oil sands, and maybe some of the other heavy oils have a 10 to 30 percent uh, carbon penalty attached to them. And associated with that was Debbie's mention of the pet coke that's left when we use it. Um, and I liked uh, Adam's analogy, because I had also thought of it, that 
dealing with some of these things uh, singly is like putting your finger in the dike, um, which makes me think we really have to be dealing with demand rather than trying to limit supply. And that leads me to the question about policy, which, which you've raised. How do we think about policy in this new world? And my answer is how we would like to think about it is probably not how we will. We would like to think of grand bargains, carbon taxes and so on. In fact, we'll deal with decisions as they come along. And the next one is going to be the Keystone Pipeline. If you could leave politics aside, just thinking in terms of economics and environment, should the State Department, wink, wink, approve the Keystone Pipeline? I guess I have to exempt Michael from this. You're not allowed to have a position. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I can, I can address this first, why not <laughs> go into it. Um, interesting about the Keystone Pipeline. So these extra heavy oils in Canada and all of the upgrading of the refineries in the US predate the recent awareness that there's all this ultralight oil. So if we could reverse time, we wouldn't even be here. We would not have put billions into changing every refinery, every new refinery in the US to handle extra heavy oil because it's low quality and it's difficult. It doesn't make as much gasoline and diesel and it's not really ideal. So what's very fascinating to me about this whole question about Keystone, and I don't know what will happen with the decision, but it turns out the Bakken doesn't stop at the US border. The Bakken goes into Saskatchewan. Canada has a tremendous amount of ultra-light sweet oil. So if you look at Canada as a nation, my sense is if we had the, availabil the ability to really be facile and change our minds, which is difficult when you're talking about investments and, and the world of, of how this works, I would say the best thing Canada could do would be to team up with the Bakken and turn on its light easier, accessible, easier to process, more beneficial in terms of product oil first, and keep the carbon in the ground longer. That would be you know, my sense. But that's just speaking entirely rationally about a situation <laughs> that is anything but. It's very economic and political and you know, almost <laughs> like, and it, it is a, it, the Keystone Excel pipeline is a really interesting question because it shows what happens when you invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure sets the course. Once you invest, you've made a certain decision. It shouldn't matter, sunk costs shouldn't count. In an ideal world where the market works, it doesn't work that way. You assume away sunk costs. But in our world, it matters. So it's going to be, it's almost like we're at those two futures. And unfortunately, a lot of those decisions were made which future to take before we appreciated the full scheme of the resources that we had available to us. Do you want I, to go ahead? I can say, with, with right. the risk of getting myself in trouble, I can say, give sort of my perspective on Keystone, and I, I um, wrote a, a little New York Times room for debate op-ed about uh, Keystone a while back. My perspective on it is that um, I'm sympathetic to the to the um, aims and goals of, of people who um, you know don't like the idea of Keystone. I, I fully understand the, the concerns about climate, and that's what I work on every day. Um, the other, putting on my other hat, it's, it's not clear to me that, uh, that a pipeline by pipeline, and this I think is what you were getting at, a pipeline by pipeline fight, uh, to, 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 if your goal is to stop the, the emissions of carbon, it's not clear that a, sort of a pipeline by pipeline fight is, is the way to do it. This, this reminds me of sort of, I, I will make an admission, my wife has, has sold me on the cause of Downton Abbey. How many of you in the room? <laughs> I, this, this is trench warfare, right? So you're, you're sort of, sorry, World War I and now you're sort of fighting, you're, fight, you know, you're, you're sort of in trench warfare for decades, fighting pipeline by pipeline by pipeline. When fundamentally what's going on here is that there is this global demand and this desire for more, for more oil and a better life from people in Asia and elsewhere. And so to me, it's not clear that unless you solve the underlying demand problem, which is causing the water to build up behind the dam um, in the first place, you know, you know, kind of, kind of poking, your, poking your fingers in the holes as they spring up, and one of them is Keystone, and we've got a plug for now, you know, pat ourselves on the back. It's not clear that that's, that that's really um, the sustainable long-term solution, although, again, again I, I will admit I'm sympathetic to the climate concerns. I, you know. uh, next question, yes. 
I have two questions, uh, one for the Washington Post and one for the uh, source experts. Uh, today's paper had these uh, two articles on the front page, and unfortunately one did not refer to the other. The first one was the rising temperature, and the other one was the proposal by the Virginia governor to do away with the gasoline tax. Do you comment why the Washington Post didn't compare the two? <laughs> and then the, uh, and the other is for the source people. Uh, I haven't heard much about the, whether China does or does not have these new unconventional uh, oil available. That's a, a huge question for the whole, uh, for global, with global implications. I, I think you comment on that? The placement was an ingenious and subtle effort to get you to see that, that juxtaposition. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad it worked. <laughs> All by design, huh? All by design. Um, and yeah, the answer well. on China <laughs> is um, these tight oils, and actually some of the extra heavy oils, um, the bitumens and the kerrigans, are everywhere. They're in select places in more volume. The big question for China and elsewhere around the world will be um, the confidence in investing, you know, and going in and managing this technology because it didn't spring up in a nationalized oil regime. It sprung up by independent oil producers, and they need certain, you know, a certain environment to take that type of risk. So there's, and then China's very much um, involved investing in Canada. They want, you know, the, the knowledge base. And interestingly, when I was in Canada, there, a comment was made recently about, well, you know, if things don't turn on in Canada, we'll just send all our engineers to Venezuela. So Venezuela is still very much in play, depending on what happens in that regime over the long term. Um, so really, these oils are everywhere. And we're going to have to learn how to deal and manage with all of them under all different types of conditions. But as I understand it, in China, uh, the location of these shales are in places where water is even yeah. a greater problem than it is in some parts of the United States. And that could be a limiting factor, although we're not pricing water anywhere in the world. So that right. it's only a limit to that limit. But there's, it'll still raise some costs. And, we were talking a little bit earlier, and the sense is that it's starting in America. So this is a global phenomenon, but a big question is how is America going to deal with it? Because if we learn how to deal with this whole you know, wide, diverse, heterogeneous array of oils and how to manage them, that will be telling for the rest of the world, because it will turn on for, it has turned on first here. Next question, Dan? Do you want to wait, wait for the uh, microphone for a moment? <coughs> Thanks. I'm Dan Becker from the Safe Climate Campaign. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about the comparative profitability of light and heavy oils and the profit centers of light and heavy oils compared as well. I know nothing about that. I, I mean, I can I'm start. Not... The next panel actually is going to talk a lot about prices and markets and economic shifts, so they'll get into it a lot more. Um, the, the, oil, the lighter oils make more of the petrochemical feedstock, so a very big question for our country right now is with all of this tight, light oil, are we going to bring chemical manufacturing back to the U.S.? That's a huge issue. And from a climate, I mean, there are other issues with chemical <coughs> production that we're going to have to deal with, but from a climate perspective, it's an interesting one because there's a lot of GNP growth without a lot of carbon from chemical production because you're not combusting the hydrocarbon, you're using it for other product. So that's you know, a very big issue in terms of where it goes. And then I do believe, to a large degree, if we deal with the extra heavy oils, we'll be exporting the carbon. You know, we're going to export the pet coke, the things that are more coal-like. So it becomes another issue. So profitability-wise, I think that there's money to be made at home, probably with the light oils and petrochemicals, potentially. And there's a lot of money to be made with exporting products. It's almost like. There's so much opportunity here for so many different things. You know, when you, see, when you see a change of inputs, what an entrepreneur or what an industry will say is opportunity. What can I do with this new stuff? How can I make money? So I think a lot of this is still settling out in the marketplace, moderated by infrastructure and, you know, where we're, and, and what I ultimately see, my, my doomsday, I'm not usually doomsday, is you see ships crossing in the night. You know, you'll see the raw oils 
moving in one direction, depending on who can process them. And you'll see the product crossing a night you know, with, the, with the tanker. And you're going to see in a global in environment, a global economy, you're going to see raw oil and petroleum product just much more movement. Well, I mean, we're already seeing that in petroleum products alone, right? Where we're right. shipping diesel to Europe, and Europe's shipping gasoline here. And certainly, that's a, that's a growth in the um, trend in, in how products are being traded internationally. And in order to balance out uh, refinery operations world, worldwide, uh, certainly, there is um, different degrees of price sensitivity for producing these well, what are being referred to as unconventional oils. Uh, we're not considering that kerogen would be uh, econ economical to produce within the United States um, within the next 25, 30 years, but kerogen is indeed being looked at in other parts of the world. So um, where you're at in the world does, does matter. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, not all tied oil shale gas is economic to produce. And, and indeed, while there's uh, been uh, quite a bit of enthusiasm about drilling in one play versus another play, sometimes what's found is that uh, the levels of production or the costs associated with getting that uh, production out hasn't justified. Uh, and therefore, production from those areas has actually declined somewhat at market prices. Now, Interestingly enough, one of the things that you can do when you have uh, high carbon uh, crudes and uh, a supply of natural gas is you can uh, do what's called hydro treating, yeah. uh, which is the opposite of coking. Yeah. And it, it allows you to take the carbon, insert hydrogen into it, and you get to produce um, fuels from it. Um, and these are more the distillate fuels. So um, while one of the changes that's been occurring globally, not just within the United States, but globally, is the increased demand for distillate fuels over motor gasoline. And by taking the uh, methane, converting it to hydrogen and hydro treating and, and producing more distillate, um, we're meeting a global demand for distillate. Uh, and this is important from a GDP perspective because um, where other parts of the world are looking to industrialize, looking to improve standards of living, haven't yet invested, say, in rail infrastructure and other ways of moving large quantities of products uh, 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 to consumers from producers in, in an efficient means. This means having to go through trucks and, and, and other modes of shipment which are less efficient, which means increasing their lifestyles, increasing their quality of life, means larger uh, consumption of, of distillate type fuels. So th these are parts of the trends that are occurring in the United States and globally that are shifting where the profits are to be made. I, I was just going to say, I think the question's a complicated one to answer. It's been hard from a reporting point of view, too, because you, you have bigger differentials in different crude qualities. And you have, because of some transportation bottlenecks, you have some localized uh, issues. So we've got you know, all our East Coast refineries, except one, essentially closing down because they can't make any money. And you've got uh, similar kinds of refineries in the middle of the country who are who are making a lot of money because of, of logistic issues. And um, also, uh, the same goes for the oil sands. I mean, the, the ability to get that to the Texas Gulf is important, is seen as by Canada and producers there as important to getting better prices. But in fact, if you're a refiner on the Texas coast, you want it because you think you're going to be able to bargain for lower prices, because now you'll be able to play off the Venezuelan oil against the Canadian oil. And at what point will that push prices down for that particular kind of oil down low enough where it's not so attractive to keep expanding production in that oil sands region? And in fact, uh, oil sands production figures have, have always been revised downward in forecasts in the last few years so that those numbers, while they're, they're growing and they're large, aren't quite as large as a lot of people had uh, anticipated them to be some years ago. Next question. Um, sorry, in the back closest to Dan, yeah, thank you.
David McCabe with Clean Air Task Force. Uh, I think this question is, is mainly for Deborah. Um, it's really important to look at that carbon intensity of fuels, and, and we certainly, I certainly understand that the heavier fuels have that, that big carbon penalty. Um, I'm wondering, though, about the lighter fuel, the, well, the, the tight fuels, simply because I'm not sure that we should think that the high amount of flaring in North Dakota would be anomalous moving forward um, because of the decline, the rapid decline of each well. You know, will it be worthwhile to build uh, pipelines even when you're pretty close to the pipeline network? And then, of course, there's going to be a lot of tight oil um, everywhere from Alaska to wherever that's very far from the pipeline network. So I think that's a real question for the carbon intensity of tight oil. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that there are general rules of thumb on where the carbon is packaged in different oils, but everything is moderated by the factors of where that is, how far down, how deep it is, what the infrastructure is, what the processes are that you choose to use. So there's a lot of investments along the way that are now not informed by anything carbon. But I don't think that you can say it's that it will, I think that there, if you were to index oils honestly, you would really look at those oils and not say just because you're labeled this oil. In fact, I think we'll find that some of the tight oils are lower carbon and some of the tight oils are higher carbon. And some of the oil sands or the heavy oil, there will be a range in how much carbon it has. And actually, that's already happening. There's oil sands that are in um, sandstone, and there are oil sands that aren't even reported right now that are in carbonate, but they're going to be more difficult to extract. So even the oil sands themselves are so many different things. So I think we're going to have to do differentiation and parsing and not rest too much on a target of a name. But Deborah, I'm not sure that was what the question was. I think the, the or if it wasn't, maybe it was what the question was, but it's raised a different question in my mind. Is that that uh, because these uh, oil shale uh, uh, shale oil wells, rather, uh, basically produce half their production in the first 18, 24 months, right? And so presumably your, the natural gas profile is going to be something similar. So will companies fail to make the infrastructure investments to capture that natural gas? Because, you know, in 18, 24 months, they're not going to need that infrastructure, yeah. really. And is that a problem in kind of measuring the carbon impact, given that the, the higher climate impact of, of it, methane. In North American prices, the, the value of the gas in these Bakken wells is very small compared to the value of the oil. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. So, Globally, that's not necessarily the case. In Asia, Europe, and other places, the, this gas-oil uh, price decoupling, or oil-natural oil gas price decoupling, hasn't happened so much. They're much closer to tracking each other. So, so but in, in North Poland Dakota... Or somewhere else, it would make more sense to try, to try and capture this gas. But in a place like North Dakota, do you see that flaring level coming down, and that, you know, the flaring level is, when the last I looked, 34% of the yeah. gas is being flared, putting North Dakota right behind... So, Iraq, Iran, <laughs> Russia, and Nigeria in terms of flaring. Actually, it's, it's even more interesting than that. So I had a conversation with a guy in North Dakota who uh, works for a company that manufactures an advanced flare tip that they've patented. So this is the story he told, and this will take a second. Um, <laughs> they size uh, the, the flare tip uh, to meet EPA uh, 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 tip exit velocity regulations for initial production because you need to be within EPA regs when you're uh, when you have this flush production. Forgive me. I think it's 400 feet per second is the is the exit velocity allowed. And that's for EPA. safety. And that's for safety issues. So they size the flare tips for that. What happens in 18 months when your production is uh, is half of what it was before? All of a sudden your gas production is down. You have what's called a lazy flare or sort of in, inefficient combustion. You have a sputtering flare, and actually that results in high rates of methane stripping and fugitive emissions are higher uh, from the flare because you can you can essentially in high wind conditions you can strip off some of the methane away from the flame front because your your exit velocity is not is not good. They've designed a flare tip that actually adjusts dynamically to the flow rate so that you always have a, essentially a back pressure that forces um, uh, forces the exit velocity to be a nice high velocity so that you get a, get a, get a good uh, basically a good flame uh, on, on the flare. But there, the nuances there are incredible. I, I, I don't, um, I don't have a good sense of whether it's going to make sense uh, to to develop these gas resources. The gas is so cheap. 
uh, it's it's not clear that, that there's going to be a whole lot of incentive for them to put in the put in the infrastructure. I don't think it will be ignored. You know, so whether it's done, it's managed by regulation or by some sort of carbon pricing where methane is a CO two equivalent gas, it's definitely going to be in the equation, especially in the U.S. Should we take one yeah. more? We're yeah, I think so. And may we go to this side over here? <laughs> Wait, why don't you uh, the let the microphone, microphone arrive? <laughs> It's coming to your right. I'm Adele Hurley from. Is that helping? No, yeah, a little, little louder. Is it, is it working? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, I'm Adele Hurley from the University of Toronto, Canadian in the room. Um, I want to pick up on Deborah's point about price being really the ultimate driver on so much of this. Um, you know, it seems to me, though, that price is just so out of whack right now because. Uh, of what would happen if we considered the externalities. And um, here I'm particularly thinking of water. And uh, the other day, ProPublica out of uh, New York published a list of what they called exempted aquifers. It stopped my heart. When did that happen? Uh, really, exempted aquifers. What a concept. Uh, what species would do that, really, when you think about it? And so when we're having these conversations about price and um, chemistry, et cetera, it seems to me that what is more likely on the psychology end of this or the sociology end of this to motivate the public is going to be uh, the water piece for a vast number of citizens continentally. So how, my question is, have, do you have any thoughts on what we can do to help make this more visible. Where are these aquifers? What districts or in Canada, what ridings? It helps a lot to make it visible. So did everybody hear the question? Okay, go ahead. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I can really add on this is that, and I've been thinking about this, we've talked about it a lot, the whole concept of mapping for everything that's about resources, whether it's water or fossil fuels, in a global world, it's going to become more and more important. You know, because that's where the forces and flows, that's where the leakage is, that's where, that's where the change is going to be. So it's going to be on the global map. So knowledge will come from that visualization. And I think the whole visualization of information you know, I would, if I had to pick, I would say prices is number one, and visualizing information is probably number two. I'm going to list in terms of agents of, you know, real change in, in, in an economy or in a sector. So I think you're definitely on to something. And the idea of um, exempting, you know, how would you know? You know, if, if you happen to live near an exempted or an unexempted aquifer. And it's going to be the same thing for do you live near a viable, um, you know, resource, oil resource or not. This is happening all over Western lands. This is interesting, and it comes to mapping. The Western lands of the US are the trifecta of oil. There's tight oil, there's the Kerrigan, and there's the bitumen. So these protected lands, a lot of them public, a lot of them national park, are going to become, you know, it's kind of the center of the storm potentially if the US goes hog wild at some point. It might not be tomorrow, but at some point. And I don't, I think that people don't really necessarily know or see that. These are just seen as kind of exempted lands in a positive way. They're public lands. Well, I think the question is a good one because water is kind of the common element for all these heavier oils, whether you're talking about oil sands or, or these. Uh, I'm sorry, sh uh, or uh, oil shales in the in the Rockies, and so uh, and as cl as the temperature goes up, to come back to today's front page article, the water issue is going to just grow uh, more and more uh, serious. So I think ultimately that'd be um, as important a policy issue, perhaps, as pricing carbon, is whether in some ways you want to price water um, beyond the cost of just piping it somewhere. We're not quite there yet, I think. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, hope we shed a little light on this.